story starts with a man called Gordon Bennett. Now, if you're a Brit, you'll certainly have heard of that name. It's uh, an old fashioned exclamation of disbelief for when, in polite company, a four letter word won't do. But you probably won't know who the man himself exactly was and why motorsport owes him such an enormous debt. Some might say, in fact, that he was the founding father of Formula One. James Gordon Bennett Jr. was a stinking rich American playboy and heir to the New York Herald media empire. Aged just 26, he took over from his father's newspaper business and set about improving the circulation of the paper by sponsoring a number of outlandish stunts. He sponsored the America Cup yacht race, balloon racing, aircraft racing, he even funded trips to the Arctic and to Africa. So what are we doing here in Ireland? Well, uh, we'll get to that in a minute. It's rumoured that he spent the equivalent of $40 million in his lifetime funding a very lavish lifestyle. He was a bit of a rogue and he didn't care what people thought of him either. One of his favourite tricks was to go into New York's swankiest restaurants and try and whip the tablecloth from underneath the unsuspecting diners. He wasn't very good at it and he usually left the maitre d' a wedge of dollars in compensation. See, Bennett himself never actually owned a car but he did like to get screaming drunk and take his horse and coaches out for midnight joyrides, usually naked apart from a pair of patent leather boots. Now that is a strong That's look. That's a good look. <laughs> However, his days as New York's leading socialite were numbered when on New Year's Day, 1876, the legless Bennett decided to gate crash his fiance's swanky dinner party. He managed to upset most of New York's great and good before relieving himself in his future in-law's grand piano. And then, for a finale, he threw up on her brother. <laughs> We've all been to parties like that. Well, yeah. <laughs> At this point, it was unanimously decided that it might be best if the rascal Bennett became the overseas representative over the pond in Paris. In France, Bennett saw that the car manufacturers were improving their products through testing and competitions and he saw an opportunity to stir up international rivalries. He decided to lay down a competition and the newspaper declared that manufacturers would have to fight to uphold their reputation and he commissioned a 17 kilo solid silver trophy. The inaugural race took place in 1900. The plan was to invite three cars from all of the nations competing and paint them in the same colour so the spectators would have a better idea of who was in the lead. So France chose French blue, the Germans chose white, and the Americans red, which meant that Britain's national colours, the red, white and blue, had all been snapped up. So they decided to stick with the, the standard livery of their Napier race cars, which was a sort of drab olive green. Well, the first race in France was absolute chaos. Spectators wandered onto the course, livestock got in the way, and the French driver Charon was driving at 60 miles an hour in his panard when a St Bernard's dog wandered into the track and got wedged in his steering. Still, he went on to win. The trophy holders France won the race again in 1901 quite easily, and it was only the British in 1902 that had a machine and a driver capable of taking on the mighty Gallic teams. That driver was Selwyn Edge. He ditched his heavy 17 litre, 70 horsepower car and took a 50 horsepower Napier, which was a lot lighter and a lot more nimble. And of course, his win in France meant that the 1903 race would actually come to the UK. And it was a good job that the British did win because racing in France was subsequently banned after the carnage of the 1903 Paris Madrid race, which had left three spectators, five drivers dead and almost 100 people seriously injured. See, the problem was, especially in rural backwaters, is that no one had seen a car move that quickly, and they couldn't anticipate how quickly they needed to move out the way. There was only one problem with the race coming to the UK in 1903, and that's the fact that the speed limit... It's a bit of a big problem. <laughs> it's a big problem. The speed limit was just 12 miles per hour. Bennett's team campaigned for the race to be held in sparsely populated Ireland, which of course was part of Britain at the time, and it took a special act of Parliament to get the speed limit temporarily lifted before a date could be set. 
However, Gordon Bennett knew that his race had to run like clockwork without incident if it was to have any future. For this race, the logistics involved were colossal. 7,000 policemen were drafted in, plus 1,000 volunteers. They closed off hundreds of roads, farmers were ordered to fence in their livestock, and uh, even vicars were told <laughs> to inform their congregation to abstain from drinking on race day so they wouldn't get sloshed and wander into the path of cars. Of course, racing drivers back in those days were all larger than life characters. Probably none more so than uh, Camille Genazzi, who headed up the German team in their identical 9.3 litre Mercedes. He was nicknamed the Red Devil, partly due to his fiery temperament, but partly because of his twin-pronged ginger beard. The American team consisted of a single peerless and two Wintons, one driven by the company founder Alexander Winton and the other by his sales manager. The confident French team brought over a Moors and two very well prepared Panards. And their leader, René de Hnif, was odds on favourite to actually bring the trophy home for France once again. He's the only racing driver in the world with a name that sounds like a sneeze. De Hnif! <laughs> Bless you. Selwyn so Edge led the British team in a quest to retain their crown. It led a, a trio of Napiers. These were painted in shamrock green as a mark of respect to the Irish who were very kind in hosting the race. And that's where we get British racing green from. That's also the reason we brought this Morgan. <laughs> not because it's a fantastic car, not because it's got a Mustang engine in it, not because it's a convertible and the sun is shining, no. We thought you might get confused <laughs> about the shade of green, so we yeah. had to borrow this 300 horsepower 50,000 pound car direct from the factory. Because it's green. It's got some interesting parallels. I mean, it's probably the closest thing you can get to Selwyn Edge's 13.7 litre Napier that you could actually buy today. It's got a thumping great 3.7 litre Mustang engine up front, strapped to a, a chassis that was designed in 1936. As recently as that. As recently as that. <laughs> so it's a mishmash of technologies, really. But, it's, but it's it a, works. It's a glorious piece of engineering, isn't it? And whilst the Napier, I suppose, was a tool to get the job done, this is, well, it's art, isn't it? I don't think you buy a car like this for, for what it does on paper, or even really what it, what it can do on track. You buy it for how it makes you feel, and it makes you feel great. It makes everybody smile. It's very rare you drive a car that everybody smiles at. Everybody smiles at this. True. Talking about British Racing Green, there isn't, strictly speaking, there isn't one shade of British Racing Green. It's been all sorts of shades. This car, technically, is Jaguar Brooklyn's Green. 50 yeah. shades of green, you could say. <laughs> it can hit 60 in 5.5 seconds and carry on to 140 mile an hour if you can stand the wind noise. And it makes a lovely, <laughs> lovely sound. Near this spot at the Ballyshannon Crossroads on the 3rd of June 1903, at 7 o'clock in the morning, the starting pistol was fired and the number one car of Selwyn Edge roared away from the line and he had a riding mechanic with him that it was his, uh, his cousin, Cecil. Cecil. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing to think that they had a, a riding mechanic to fix problems along the way. Obviously, you don't get that now. No. Who was next? The dashing driver, Denif, was next up in car number two and he took a far more relaxed approach to it and was waving to the crowd for much of the first lap. Uh, next up was Percy Owen in a flimsy looking Winton and that was before the number four car of uh, Genazzi, the Red Devil, put his big white Mercedes on the start line. Uh, Genazzi was the, was the opposite of the jovial de Knuff. He was really competitive and uh, smoke and flames belched from the back of his white Mercedes and the crowd absolutely loved it. And the story goes he actually cut grooves in the dirt road as he spun off. Um, also, Selwyn Edge's uh, Napier was described as a green comet by one of the Irish reporters, leaving quite a tra poetic, trail yeah. of dust in its wake. Yeah, so uh, quite an event. The 328 mile circuit was actually a large figure of eight. We went out to Kilcullen, Kildare, Stradbally and Athy, followed by a western loop which went out to Castle Dermot, to somewhere else and Athy again. <laughs> I'm glad you're driving and not navigating. 
on the very first lap, John Stock's Napier hit a hedge and ended up in a ditch. But Selwyn Edge's race was going a little bit better and he was the hot favourite, despite the fact that he stopped on the first lap for sponge cake and strawberries. Now that's, that's my kind of racing driver. That's class, that is. <laughs> I like that. You don't get Vettel doing that, do you? No. Montoya, maybe. <laughs> It was on the second lap that the real drama unfolded, however, when Charles Jarrett's Napier, the steering completely failed and the car was out of control just as he V-maxed it to a heady 70 mile an hour. The car hit an embankment, flipped over and sent Jarrett 20 yards down the road. His mechanic, Bianchi, was trapped underneath the vehicle and got quite badly burned by the hot exhausts. The story goes that a priest turned up and declared both men dead. So the priest and some local volunteers stretched the bodies off to a local farm. And then of course, Jarrett came to. And when he awoke, he thought he was dead because all he could see was white. And that's because he was under a white sheet and he could hear Bianchi next to him groaning. So when Edge's race was about to take a turn for the worst, however, when he lost two tyres in the next two laps and he could hardly see anything for the steam spewing out of his damaged radiator. The Americans were having a bad day at the office as well, with only Owen's troublesome Winton trailing at the back of the pack. So now the race was turning into a two-horse race. It was essentially between the laid-back De Kniff and the fiercely competitive Genazzi in the white Mercedes. Then, of course, the weather took a turn for the worse. They started to hail. Now you imagine they've got an open cockpit and they're doing 60 miles an hour and they're being pelted by hailstones. The driver's faces were red raw. Genazzi, the Red Devil, continued to stamp his authority on the race. But what few people knew is that Genazzi had an added incentive. Mercedes, who were keen to showcase their new vehicles, had promised any Mercedes driver that lifted the trophy a £5,000 bonus. Of course, back in 1903, that was serious cash. In the end, the white Mercedes of Genazzi came home first, a clear 11 minutes ahead of the Knuff. And that meant, of course, that as the winning nationality, the Germans would take the race to Homburg for the 1904 race, where other Europeans joined the, uh, joined the fun. Eventually, the Gordon Bennett Trophy turned into the 1906 French Grand Prix, which is the forerunner to Formula One as we know it today. Well, how do you compare the Gordon Bennett Trophy of 1903 to today's Formula One? It's still very much a rich man's game. I mean, back then, Racing was essentially for aristocrats and playboys and the wealthy. And of course the manufacturers cottoned on to this and really kept everybody sweet. And today, you've got to be wealthy to go racing. So I guess in that respect, nothing much has changed. And it's still, of course, a very international game. Mercedes are still in it. That's true. Napier finished off making engines for diesel locomotives, I think was the last thing they did. That's not, not a very glamorous end, is it? Yeah. And what about the freight? Well, Pallard's Pallard became Peugeot, didn't they? Yeah, they did, yeah, which is the kiss of death for anything, really, isn't it? <laughs> so Gordon Bennett got exactly what he wanted, a media storm which helped him flog a few more papers. But what he couldn't have foreseen was the huge impact that he was to have in motoring in general. And because of him, motorsport was popularised across the entire world. And the trickle-down technology from some of those race cars vastly improved the ordinary road cars in terms of performance and reliability. I think the, uh, the British and Irish people proved that motorsport could be well organised, could be competitive and could appeal to the masses. Uh, and of course it was the forerunner to, uh, to Grand Prix racing and Formula One as we know it today, which is fantastic. The other thing, I think the British owe a debt of gratitude to the Irish for British Racing Green because True. it was born here. And that tribute lives on with our glorious Morgan, of course, which is outside. But uh, when Selwyn Edge won the race in 1902 and Genazzi won here in Ireland in 1903, car sales went through the roof, they tripled in Britain. For some of the spectators at the first time, they'd even seen a car, but it proved to the masses that there was a viable alternative to the, to the horse and car. But it was the age of exciting characters and aristocrats and playboys, and there's an incredible colour and passion in the racing that you don't see today. There's none of this for sure, the team did good, energy drink bollocks, it's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think we can say that on camera. Unwittingly, Gordon Bennett, the hard-drinking international playboy who had left the United States in disgrace, 
after desecrating a perfectly good grand piano, who is not our role model in any way, had in fact kick-started the petrol age. And for that, we would like to thank you. So yeah. cheers, Gordon.